Last episode, episode number 41, we talked about electricity in your woodworking shop. Today, episode 42, we're going to talk about electronics in your woodworking shop. Hi, my name's Roger Kugler, and this is Working at Woodworking Podcast, where I try to provide information, maybe some inspiration, to get you to take your skills into your community, fixing rocking chairs, building tables, maybe bookcases, and making money doing it. Probably the first piece of electronic in your woodworking shop is going to be your cell phone. I don't know anyone except maybe some businesses that are still using the old landlines. So that cell phone is an integral part of your business. And I do hope that you are counting its expense on your taxes. Today we are left with only three major carriers for cell phone service. Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. What? What about Sprint? Well, Sprint got bought up by T-Mobile in, I think it was April of 2020. So they are no more. And there's a lot of minor carriers out there. Cricket, US Cellular, Mint, Google Fi. But all of these secondary carriers are piggybacking onto one of the majors. You can do a Google search and find a Wikipedia page that shows, you know, all the the ugly details. There's like, I don't know, 313,000 of the minor carriers out there, and they tend to be rather regional. So it just depends where you live, what is going to be available for you. So do you want to stay with one of the major carriers or go with one of the secondary carriers? I think a lot of that has to do with your geographic location. It used to be that one of the major carriers were stronger in some parts of the country and less so in other parts of the country. My first carrier was T-Mobile and it pretty much sucked. And when the contract remember those, ran out, I switched to Verizon and had much, much better service. Now, I think with most parts of the country, it's pretty well even. So the big thing is just to do some shopping. You know, check the coverage, make sure that you are covered, ask friends and family what they have. And if someone's not happy with their service, you'll probably hear about it. Look at the cost. Some of these can be actually quite reasonable. Some can be a little bit on the expensive side. And look at what you're paying for. What's the data package, if that's something that you use a lot of? What are the bells and whistles? Sometimes a carrier can route different phone numbers into the same phone. They have callback features, just all kinds of things. Spam blockers. I think if a carrier would come out with a technology to block like 99% of all spam calls, they would easily dominate the market. But from what I understand, the carriers are actually making money off the spam calls. So I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon. For more information about your cell phone Check out episode number 19, Your Business Phone. All kinds of good information there. And of course, you have a cell phone service, you need a cell phone. A lot of people will buy a new cell phone and others will buy used or refurbished, as it's called. I think the very first phones I bought way back in 2002, when I my very first cell phone I got from T-Mobile. But after that, we've always been buying refurbished phones. In fact, my wife and I just upgraded our phones. Remember that dinosaur that I used to complain about? Well, I've moved up into the world to a Samsung Galaxy S9. <coughs> That's only about, what, four or five years old. And I got it from goagain.com. I actually did some work for the uh, gentleman that owns that company. They're based out of Arizona. 
and very good price, very good service. If you're in the market for a refurbished phone, I would definitely recommend you check out their website, link in the show notes. And one thing with the older phones, you do need to be a little careful of as our technology is progressing. We're getting rid of the the older technologies, the 2G, the 3G, and moving on to the 5G. Some of the older phones aren't going to make that transition, so always check before you make that switch. So, what about using your phone for business? Everyone has a cell phone, but you're starting your woodworking business. Are you going to use that same cell phone, that same cell number, and having your your grandmother call you during business hours and taking up a bunch of time? Or do you want something that's dedicated just to your business number? Well, that's where Unitel Voice VOIP can help. And there's a link in the show notes. They are an affiliate to Working at Woodworking. They can provide a separate number just for your business and route it so that your your business phone and your personal phone can exist on the same device. It would be a very very convenient. And it's not very expensive. It's like $10 a month or something like that. Check them out. Link in the show notes. So other than answering the phone and making phone calls, what else are you going to use your cell phone for? For me, I use a camera quite a bit. Anytime that I get a piece of furniture in, I make sure I take photos of it. These can come in handy for the before and after shots, but honestly, I'm not very good at doing that. I take photos so that my feeble old mind will remember exactly how this thing looked before I tore into it and started cutting pieces away. I know how it's supposed to go back together. And here's a here's a little hint. If you're doing any repairs to your electricity items, such as your router stopped working or your random orbit sander stopped working, and you unplug it first, tear the thing apart, 99% of the time it's a continuity problem. Something is not connected. Take a photo before you tear things apart part so that you remember which wires go where. I've never personally had that problems, but I read about someone who had that problem in the past, and this was the way they solved it. There are all kinds of apps out there for your cell phones. I mean, there's hundreds, probably thousands of apps. I've only used a couple with any regularity. Timberopolis is one that I have found particularly useful. That's T-I-M-B-E-R-P-O-L-I-S. You can calculate just all kinds of things. I will use it at like maybe I'm at an auction and there's a stack of of lumber right there and I got to figure out how much that weighs to determine how much I can carry home or if I'm going to have to make multiple trips. You just go in and enter the species, enter the moisture content. You know, if it's air dried, typically it's going to be around 15% or so and the number of board feet. In fact, if you don't know the board feet, there's a calculator on there that you can enter the dimensions and it will calculate the board feet for you. I just do it as a rough stack. You know, if it's two feet wide and 18 inches tall, I enter that number into it, maybe subtract 20% for for air gap and punch that board foot number into the calculator and it comes back and says that stack of wood weighs 217 pounds. Now, I could probably do that in one trip on my roof rack if I'm not traveling very far. Might be better off making two trips with that. If someone's tree came down in a storm and they've called you up and asked if you want the tree because, well, you're a woodworker, you use wood, why wouldn't you take their tree? Maybe a tree service came in and cut everything apart, took away all the branches and have left the bull of the tree, the the actual trunk. How much does that weigh? You can pull up the calculator in Temperopolis and enter the butt size, the other end diameter, and the length, and a species, and it will give you the weight of that trunk. Also doing some research for this episode, I came across Fractional Calculator. Wow, what an idea! 
So instead of having to convert everything to decimal, you can enter 3 inches, the numerator 5, the denominator 16, and add something to 3 and 5 sixteenths. Did not know that existed. Wow, technology. That is really something. So if you kind of struggle with fractions, you can use this fractional calculator to enter the actual fraction and let it do all of the math. You remember that, calculating the least common denominator, adding the numerators, and carrying the one. Yeah, just let the, just let the cell phone do that. Other apps I've used on my cell phone, Sound Meter. This is pretty cool. If you want to know just how loud your table saw is, or your circular saw, or your router, download the little Sound Meter app and hold it, you know, specified distance away, and it will tell you that's 87 dB, that's 110 dB. Pretty interesting. There's a Leaf Snap app where you can take a picture of a leaf and it searches the database, matches it up, and comes back and says that is a red oak. If you're into tree identification, that could be real handy. I also use an app called Color Note. It's just a really simple little note-taking app. I'll put on there I need to buy rags. I need a 3 8 inch deep socket. I need to pick up a box of 8 by 1 and a quarter wood screws. Just that's where I keep my shopping list because you get to the hardware store and you picked up two items but you know there was something else that you needed and you're just standing there staring up at the nuts and bolts not being able to remember what else it was you needed. Now the people at my hardware store are really really good because they'll come up and say Roger what are you looking for? And I say I don't know. And they'll offer wasn't it quarter inch washers? <gasps> That's right that is. These guys are really really good. One of the other great things I use my, my cell phone for is depositing checks. Oh my gosh I have not been in a drive through at the credit union for probably years. This is so convenient. Customer comes in, picks up their, their baby cradle that needed some repair, and they write me out a check. Thank you very much. They're super happy. I can come in and open up the bank app and hit deposit, take a photo of the front of the check, and after I endorse it, mobile deposit only on the back, take a picture of that, boom, it goes into the account. Wow, isn't technology wonderful? Which is literally the same thing the bank is doing themselves. They don't have a person sitting there punching in all these numbers. No, they have readers that are doing that. So you are just kind of literally cutting out the, the middle person uh, in that transaction. There's an app called Woodmaster HD by John Lully, L-U-L-L-I-E. It costs $7.99, but it looks like it has a lot of features on it. I don't have it, but if you kind of struggle with shop math, that might be a good thing to check out. It has board foot calculators, it has fractional calculators, and it gets into panel and door sizing, all kinds of things. And of course, we use our cell phones to check the weather and to do social media marketing, if you're into that type of thing, which I am not. But a cell phone is just kind of a required piece of equipment for modern society now. So I'd be really curious if you are using an app that you have found to be very, very uh, helpful. Drop me a line, send me an email. I would be more than interested to, to hear what you're using. Other pieces of electronics in your shop? Well, you may have a computer in your shop. A surprisingly high number of woodworkers do. Why? Well, let's face it. We run our business off of a computer. We're running bookkeeping software. We're sending invoices. We're keeping you know, track of our expenses. Maybe you're using it to do computer-aided design, CAD. Perhaps you are using it to do CNC work. I could talk, you know, the rest of the day about computers, but if you check out episode number nine, your woodworking shop office, I, I kind of take a deep dive into all things computer, different software, different operating systems, things like that. As far as software and apps, your 
bookkeeping software is probably the big one on there, but Cut List Optimizer. If you are doing anything with sheet goods, and really anything with just rough lumber too, you can enter the dimensions of your project into Cut List Optimizer, and it will calculate the sheet good requirement, you know, the, the number of sheets of plywood that you need and it will show the best way of cutting up those sheets to minimize waste and with the price of plywood now you have to do everything you possibly can to minimize that waste if you're using hardwood you enter the stock that you have you know the boards one by six and a half one by eight and a half uh, one by ten and the length and it will come back and get give you the optimized way of cutting your parts out of the stock available to reduce wastage. The one problem with doing it that way is it negates grain. And most people, if you're building a piece of fine furniture, it is all about the grain. So you have to take that into account. You're going to want to order more lumber if you're doing a piece like that. If you're building a a paint grade, maybe a a table out of poplar, eh, grain's not really important at all. Or you can go with maple that in essence has no grain, so it's kind of a a non-issue. But cut list optimizer, very, very useful tool. Other pieces of electronic gear, tablets, you know, kind of like mini computers, very, very handy. I don't have one. I do have a Chromebook that sometimes ends up out in the shop. Very convenient. Uh, I have a big, ugly desktop computer, and obviously I can't take it out there. But there are some times that I uh, will use the Chromebook out in the shop. And that's also handy if you're going on vacation or something and you need to, to maintain your Etsy store or, you know, do other types of things. The Chromebook is really nice. I've been impressed with that. Shop TV. Yeah, a lot of people have shop TVs. Typically, they're kind of a a hand-me-down TV, a repurposed TV, because, well, it could be a dusty environment, and, and dust and electronics don't really go together, so I don't think I would put a lot of money into a TV for the shop, but usually there's there's an older set, you know, lying around someplace that you can utilize. Thank goodness for flat screen TVs. I went decades with the old CRT TV and it took up a chunk of space. I got rid of that and turned that into lumber storage and now have a little flat screen that I built a cabinet for and it lives up on the ceiling. I can just pull it down whenever I want to use it. So what about shop gadgets? This is where the the real magic happens, I think. Digital calibers. Oh my gosh, what a wonderful device. Now I've used calibers, a dial caliper in a shop for, well, decades. Not because I'm trying to get down to the, the thousandths of an inch, but it's just a lot easier to read for these old eyes to to see what the measurement is that is so convenient. Uh, The family bought me a electronic caliper for Christmas one year and that has turned out to be incredibly handy. I can switch between fractions, you know, three and five sixteenths, or the decimal, 3.3125, I believe. Or you can switch to millimeters. And that has come in very handy on some projects, having the ability to get an accurate millimeter reading. Because one of the big problems with the metric scale is you go down to millimeters, one millimeter. You can't go down to a 32nd or a 64th of an inch. I find that a little frustrating. You have to go into a decimal of a millimeter, which the only way to really read that is with some type of a caliper. And of course, I have digital readouts on my planer and my table saw. These are fantastic. No more parallax error where you're looking down at the cursor through the little magnifier window onto the scale. Well, is that three and five sixteenths or is that just a little bit over? And with the digital scale, boom, it is right there. A wonderful thing about a digital scale, particularly on the table saw, is repeatability. If you make a cut at 
3.675 and a whole bunch of other cuts and you need that one more piece of that part you can go back to 3.675 and set it and it is dead accurate it is right there you don't have to sit there and monkey around oh i think that's it then you lock it down and it moves a little bit no when it's at 3.675 it is right there i love that about the digital readout on a table saw Another favorite gadget in the professional woodworking shop would be a moisture meter. And I don't have one. No, that's right. I, I don't have a moisture meter. Um, I've felt bad about that for, for several years. Um, had to talk to some people about that. Um, I could buy a moisture meter. But, you know, to be really honest, I've never come across a situation that I absolutely had to know what the number of the moisture of that wood was. Now, I don't live in Houston or Phoenix or Los Angeles, Denver or Annapolis. I live in the upper Midwest, you know, Indiana, and it's a pretty favorable climate. We don't have great extremes, particularly in humidity. You know, when humidity gets to 75 percent, people around here start dropping like flies. But, you know, in some parts of the country, that moisture meter is, is everything. But for me, no, I've, I've, I've never, and I've, I've never had a piece of furniture blow apart because of wood movement because of the excessive moisture. You build for wood movement, and that just kind of takes care of it. So now I'm, I'm probably not a, a real woodworker because I, I don't own a moisture meter. But I'll get over it. Now, one gadget that I do have that I have really enjoyed is a laser thermometer. Yeah, for woodworking. Okay, it's not actually a laser thermometer. It's an infrared thermometer, but it uses a laser as a pointer. And I find this very handy when trying to analyze that bearing of the table saw or a, a multiplaner that seems to be getting a little hot. Well, you can pull that out and you can actually see how hot it is. And kind of a, a built-in thermometer that we have as humans is our fingertips. Our fingertips register 140 degrees as hot. In other words, if you put your fingers on a pillow block and you can't hold them there, it is greater than 140 degrees. When you're sharpening your tools, when that tool becomes so hot that you can't hold onto it, you are passing 140 degrees and you need to quench the tool. You're not really going to damage the tool until you get up into, depending on the metal, 350, 450, someplace in there. But use your fingers to tell you when something is hot. And the infrared thermometer will be exact. You can also use that, particularly if your shop is cold during the winter, to determine just how warm your lumber is or your, your coffee table before you refinish it. You know, a lot of finishes, you have to be above 45 degrees, 55 degrees, and you can use the infrared thermometer to tell exactly what it is. Also test your finish to make sure that it is not too cold. And of course, they're just kind of fun. You know, the next time you mix up a batch of epoxy and you get your glue up done, put the thermometer on it and just watch how the exothermic reaction is is occurring and, and the temperature rise as that pot starts to, to cook off. Good fun. How about an anemometer? A wind speed indicator. You can pick these up on Amazon for like 20 bucks. It has a little propeller on there, and as that spins, it calculates the wind speed in, in miles per hour or knots or kilometers per hour. And I find it handy with the dust collection system to see just exactly the difference between the airflow of a 4-inch line and a 3-inch line or even a 2-inch line. Also hook it up to your uh, shop vac and see just what the airflow is off that. My fist tool MIDI, I'm getting about 98, 99 miles per hour on that thing. Pretty, pretty phenomenal. 
other handy gadgets in the workshop. Laser tape measures. This is one of those other things that just kind of goes against normal psyche of a traditional woodworker, but boy, does that come in handy, especially if you're doing any type of work in a home, uh, build-ins, maybe trim, carpentry, something like that. It's a regular tape measure that has a laser built into it. So you hit the laser and it comes back and it says that's 22 feet, 7 inches, and 5 sixteenths. Run the tape out and measure. And if you're measuring between walls, you can't bend the tape to see exactly what that last little bit is. Yeah, that might be 5 sixteenths. That might be an eighth. Can't really tell. It takes that guesswork out just incredible are they accurate well they're as accurate as your bent tape measure is between you know the inside of of two cabinets and you have to bend that tape to get that inside measurement yeah yeah they're 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 accurate and if you want a laser measure without the tape, Bosch makes some really, really good ones that are not terribly expensive. You know, you can spend several hundred dollars on them, but they have one unit, the last I checked, was around like 85 bucks or so. I mean, it was small. And they can be really, really handy, especially, you know, if you're installing kitchen cabinets and things like that, or if you're taking exterior measurements and it's not a really bright day. I mean, that's going to be as accurate as, you know, stringing a a hundred foot tape and having a great big catenary, you know, as that tape is sagging in there. So look at the specs of the laser measuring device and it will tell you, you know, it's within an eighth of an inch over a hundred feet or something like that. That's that's usually good enough for, for government work. Or you could build your own laser measuring device. Pick up a Arduino, maybe an Uno, and the right infrared chip. And, well, I left a link for a YouTube video from a guy who shows you how you could actually make your own electronic measuring device. It's really, really pretty interesting. Yeah, it's getting into electronics and a little bit of programming. But, hey, you know, you got to have something to keep the uh, the sawdust from, from clogging up between the years. So what is your favorite electronic gadget. There's a bunch of them out there. I just kind of, you know, hit some of my favorites. Let me know what your favorite ones are. As far as recommendations for this week, I came across a YouTube video by Matt at Lincoln Street Woodworks on YouTube. Do you remember in episode 39, I talked about uh, how to maximize your profits in your woodworking business? And I was talking about buying lumber and how it might not be the most profitable thing for you to buy that stack of air dried lumber, you know, from the, the guy out in the, the country and transporting it and milling it and so on and so forth. Well, Matt goes into a deep dive on this very same subject. And so, link in the show notes, check that out. Miss Jobs, I had a phone call from a Karen. That was her name. And she sounded a bit in distress. She was selling her home and she had a buyer who she described as being very particular. And she had done a a lot of work remodeling her her house and she was moving some furniture and kind of chipped one of the stair treads right at the right at the the bull nose the edge and she was under a lot of stress and i haven't been taking new jobs as you guys know hence the purpose of this podcast but i did help her out I asked her to send me a photo of it because I was really trying to convince her that she could do this repair, but I went ahead and stopped by on my way to the post office, and literally, I was not there for more than five minutes, and it was, she just kind of buggered up the the very edge and I was able to carve away some of the the broken wood fibers behind the chip it hadn't broken out and I worked some glue back in there and and pressed it back in and I even used some stain she actually had the the original stain and I just kind of worked that in there to kind of blend all the colors together and I put a piece of you know blue masking tape over it and told her to check on it the next day and as I suspected, it was 
perfectly fine. Nothing else needed to be done with it. But I, I mean, at five minutes, I, I couldn't really charge her for that. I know all the textbook says that you're supposed to do, you know, a minimum, you know, charge. But my point is, there are people out there who need your skills, uh, particularly if you are getting into furniture repair and furniture refinishing. There's a lot of work that you can do in the home. People need on-site repairs. And honestly, when it comes to kitchen tables, if I can do that at the homeowner's place instead of dragging that great big monstrosity you know, to, to my tiny little shop, I will do that every time. So something to consider. I'd like to do a shout out and a special thanks to our listeners in Montreal, Quebec, and also Danville, Indiana. Really appreciate that. So check out the show notes. There's some affiliate links in there that might be of interest to you. And until next week, happy woodworking.